Right, I'm, I'm going to take up very little time, everybody. Uh, really uh, huge welcome for me. I'm Phyllis O'Grady. You see my name on the end of all the bulletins and everything. I run the scheme along with Barney Pierce. Um, we have been working really hard um, to extend the kind of activities we do to really encompass all these amazing art courses that, that go on. My own daughter went to NUA and, and loved it, so I'm, I'm passionate about NUA. Um, we work very closely with the art school, and I just want to say two things. First of all, huge thank you to Gavin and to the fantastic panel of guests he's got to talk to you tonight. Um, and also, please look out on the bulletins because um, Lynn Simkin and Gavin and I are all working really hard. We've got lots of things in the pipeline um, to do with taking you through the different uh, kind of courses you can do at NUA. So do keep looking at your bulletins. I'm going to back out now. And we've also, I should have said, Gavin, I've got another event going on <laughs> um, the same night, the same time. So I might dip in and out. So don't feel I'm being rude if I disappear. I'm going to keep jumping between meetings. But welcome, everybody. And I'll hand back over to Gavin. And thank you very much, all of you. Brilliant. Thank you very much for this. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. So my name's Gavin, and I'm part of the NICO project and based at Norwich University of the Arts. So the NICO project, we work with uh, different students from across the whole of East Anglia, but specifically with Norfolk and even more specifically with creative students uh, looking to study creative subjects at higher education level and then go into creative careers and that's really what we're going to be talking about a lot tonight uh, and within those arts we're looking specifically at creative media and we're doing a little bit of a deep dive into different aspects of film um, animation visual effects graphics and user experience and games design and just giving you a little taste of what's out there before we have our wonderful panelist tonight uh, who's going to be answering some questions and you will be able to use the chat function to uh, ask them any questions you have about the experience about the past about what they're up to now uh, but before we dive in we're going to just quickly go through some house rules so first of all if you could please keep your microphones muted and your videos turned off just so we can have a nice smooth experience for everybody um but like i said the chat function is open tonight so if you have uh, any technical issues um you'll be able to use the chat function and talk to my wonderful colleague emma who's looking around in the background making sure everything runs smoothly as possible um, but you'll also be able to use the chat function if you have any questions so be prepared with them uh, for when the panelists join us later on and just to put it out there that you can also use the chat function if you have any queries or any worries at all um, just let myself or Emma know and we'll be there on hand to help you uh, the session will be recorded uh, so keep a just remember that if you are putting your names out there into the chat function, that will be available for people to see. Um, I think that is everything with the house rules. So we'll dive straight into the session. So I just want to take you through. There we go. So I just want to take you through some facts and figures around the different industries within creative media here in the UK. So looking at animation, there are around 469 animation studios just in the UK alone. So that's around 5,400 people being employed to work on animations. And animation has been around for decades and it's still a hugely popular industry. And looking at visual effects, which is probably the youngest of the industries that we're looking at, the visual effects industry here is worth over a billion pounds. And there's this target of making it worth 4.7 billion by this year. And there's already over 200,000 jobs supported and the visual effects industry are hungry for more graduates to go into visual effects because essentially the UK is almost like the capital of the world when it comes to visual effects. There are so many of the top visual effects studios in the world right here in the UK. And the gaming market, so this is just looking at sales when it comes to video games, consoles, peripherals. That gaming market here alone is worth a staggering £7 billion, and that's bigger than movies and music combined. 
And looking at the film industry, the turnover in 2017 was £14.8 billion. Pounds. So all of these are astronomical sums. And um, looking, if you put all of that together, Creative Industries is worth together £115.9 billion. Pounds. To help break that down, that generates £13 million pounds per hour. So the creative industries within the UK, surprising, you might find it surprising that it's actually bigger than agriculture, than sports, than construction sectors, and it's actually the fastest growing sector within the UK economy. So even though there's been all of these taboos about there's no money in arts or you know working in the arts isn't a real job, it's one of the most viable things you can do, and it's only getting bigger. So if you take a look at this list, so if we're looking at the different, um, different sectors of creative media, so we've got film and moving image, we've got animation, user experience, games development, games art, and animation with VFX. And these are all the different uh, jobs and career roles you can go into just from studying these different areas. So if you look at animation, I mean, of course, you could go into animation and from the other end of studying animation, you become an animator, which is a perfectly viable thing. But with but studying animation, it opens so many doors as well. So if you look down the list there, you can uh, become a character designer. You can focus on background art. Um, you can even be really specific and you could be a set designer within the world of animation or just look at illustrations or color so there's so many other things that you can do just from studying these individual areas and some of these roles even incorporate skills that you'll find outside of creative arts so maths physics psychology these are all vital skills that you can implement within these creative subjects and these creative jobs and so if you think about sort of maths and physics and probably a little bit of coding as well um, you can use that within well animation games and visual effects when it comes to say simulation so if you're simulating uh, sort of fluid movement with hair, for example, you're going to need somebody with that background within coding the physics to come up with the formulas and to be able to create the simulation to be able to show within whatever animation or game or film you're working on for this fluid hair movement. So you'll be surprised at what skills you can actually use and incorporate within these creative subjects. And just, I'll leave you just a few seconds to really take in all the different roles here. And I'm sure there are many, many more that aren't featured on these lists here. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna quickly sort of take you through each of those subject areas and break down into the different areas that you can go into and sort of specialize in and tie that into specific courses that are actually out there that you can actually study in and then go into creative jobs from there. So if we look at film and moving image, you could probably break that down into three key areas. You've got film. So for example, here we've got 1917, which is a huge British production. Um, and that's very much about feature films, working on location or in studios. And then you've also got high-end TV, which is obviously a huge uh, part of moving image nowadays, when you've got staggering series like Game of Thrones. Um, and of course, you've also got non-fiction. So who doesn't watch Great British Bake Off, right? And you can, you know, as, as well as filming those shows, there's so many different roles tied to working on non-fiction shows. And there's so many people working in the background to make those shows happen. So those are kind of, I'd say, the three key areas uh, of film and moving image. And if we look at different courses here, there we go. So if we look at the different film and moving image courses out there in the UK, um, these are just a little flavour of what's out there. So you'll probably find a lot of courses titled as film studies. And for example, we've got a film studies course here at the University of East Anglia, which is obviously just down the road from City Centre of Norwich. And that's very much about the academic side of things. Um, so you'll be sort of reviewing a lot, looking at a lot of different theories uh, surrounding film and film history. And even though it's the more academic side of things, there are people that have gone to the film studies course at UEA and managed to go 
into sort of the more practical side of filmmaking as part of their jobs but it opens more doors sort of academically as well and then of course you have film production like we have here at NUA and that is very much about the practical side of film and by the time you finish that course you're going to have nine ten different films already made and you've already got a big portfolio of um films to show and to get into practical filmmaking from there and then, and then also you have different film schools and one example of a film school is Met Film School and a lot of film schools tend to be based in London um, which you know there's a lot of productions happening in London that's not to say that there aren't productions happening in Norwich which there are there's big studios like October Film Studios which is based in the Norfolk in, in Norfolk um but these are sort of different types of courses that you'll find uh when it comes to looking at film so we move over to animation and you can break these down into another three key areas so you have 2d hand-drawn animation like the example at the bottom right people may have seen it it's a show called scissor seven on uh, netflix and that's the, probably the most traditional form of animation. You think back to classic Disney, like Snow White being the first feature length animation. And that's all, you know, painstakingly hand drawn. Each frame is a drawing. Um, and then you have stop motion with uh, an example, that's a NUA graduates uh, with their stop motion film there and using puppetry. And fun fact, there is, it might not exist anymore. I can't, uh, I can't be 100% sure, but there was or is a puppetry apprenticeship at the Norwich Puppet Theatre. Well worth having a look. Um, and then, of course, probably the most popular form of animation nowadays is 3D computer generated. But we get amazing projects like Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which really pushes the envelope of what 3D animation can do. And it actually incorporates a lot of uh, 2D animation principles as well. And obviously with 3D uh, computer generated, it's very, it can be a lot more technical in terms of working with software, but it still incorporates a lot of those traditional values by drawing, but you'd be drawing on a tablet instead and so on. So that kind of nice, those different areas kind of nicely translate into different courses that are out there for animation. So if you look at the animation course uh, anyway, um, it's sort of more of a generalized course where you you will be doing you'll be doing 2D animation, you'll be doing 3D animation, you'll be doing stop motion, you get a little taste, a little flavor of all those different areas. And then throughout the course, you'll be able to specialize in one of those areas and go on from there. But you can get a lot more, you can become a lot more specialized for some of the courses. So for example, at Teesside University up near Newcastle, there is a specific 2D and stop motion uh, course there. And you'd be looking at all the different areas of production design and technical aspects and even a little bit of theory, but it's very much about 2D hand-drawn animation and stop motion animation. And then on the flip side of that, at the University of Harpershire, we have computer animation and visual effects. And this seems to be more common where a lot of 3D animation courses start to incorporate visual effects because We'll probably be discussing this later with the panelists that that there's a lot of transferable skills between animation games and visual effects so you start to see this kind of blend in some of the courses there but the course at university of Hertfordshire is very much focused on 3d animation and a lot of technical work so be working with specific software and work a lot of computers to generate these amazing beautiful animations and then we have, of course, visual effects and visual effects being young, being new, but very, very technical. And it's here in visual effects where you start to see a lot of, you know, computer science background and skills start creeping in here. But we have different areas like compositing, which is sort of combining different visual elements and putting them together to create the final image. So like the Game of Friends, for example, here, um they've used like green screen um and then you have all these different live action elements and when you put them all together you have your final image and then there is animation 
Uh, but a lot of people in visual effects will refer to it as rigging, where you will have a model. So like um, the still in the top right, that's from Avengers, no, not Avengers, uh, from Captain America Civil War, I believe that is. Um, and it's, if you've got that model of this uh, human in, in the armor and you are sort of manually animating and moving this model that you get given. And then there's modeling uh, where uh, you're creating characters, weapons, animals, backgrounds, all sorts of different things with uh, creating these 3D assets and going from there. And different visual effects course, um, a lot of them are the same, um, but there's two big visual effects courses here that give you very different experiences. So we have Bournemouth University, there is a visual effects course there. And it's very much the traditional university experience where you'd be on a big campus, you're in halls, um, and you get, you know, you, you're able to collaborate with different courses uh, because it's not just visual effects there. So on the Bournemouth University visual effects course, they actually work quite closely with computer animation students. So the computer animation studio uh, students give you the assets and then you use your visual effects school uh, skills to sort of tweak them, bring them to life and create these final images. But then you have a visual effects course at Escape Studios, which is it's still very much the same course, but it's, it's, it's a specialist uh, course at a very small college within London. So there's no big campus, uh, there's no actual university owned halls. A lot of it is a private accommodation or private halls that you're going into. And there, there aren't, you know, animation courses or things like that to collaborate with. Um, it's very much focused on just visual effects. So they're very, even though the course content can be quite the same, they're very different university experiences out there. And then we have games. And again, breaking it down into three different key areas. You have concept art design. Um, and that's very much all about uh, the illustration. And we've got one of our panelists to explain a lot more about that. And that's very much using more traditional art skills. Um, and then we have game development, which is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. And it's, you know, that incorporates a lot of coding. It's very technical. Uh, sometimes you get a lot of, it's more of a, a science degree than an art degree with game developments. And, but you also have 3D asset production as well, which is a good example in the top left there. Whereas building and modeling all these different assets, which you put together to create a, free, a 3D environment. So breaking it down to different courses, generally you see these two differences. So you have games art design, obviously we have them at any way, but there's a big games art design course at DeMontford University based in Leicester. Um, and it's combined, that course there combines creativity with technical skills to create 2D and 3D art for video games. Um, and then we're looking at the games development course. So like I mentioned before, uh, the one at uh, Norwich University of the Arts is actually a Bachelor in Science. Uh, and unlike the games art design course, which is a Bachelor of Arts. Um, and it's well worth taking a look at uh, the different games art design, the different games development courses, because a lot of them can blur the lines between art and development. Some will feature more coding, less coding, but generally you find that they generally split in between games art design and games development. And then looking at UX design, which is very much a specialist area, um, it's usually has been tied to graphics courses, be it graphic design or graphic communication. Uh, but user experience is essentially making services and products more user friendly. Um, and it just creates, a, it's, it's essentially creating a really easy going experience for the user. And you can break that, break that into further areas. So you have interaction design, which is really focusing on how you interact with an application or website. It's very much focusing on um, sort of, you know, almost physically interacting with a product. And then there's user interface, which is slightly different from the user experience, but it's very much focused on designing the layout and interface of a product. And a lot of times that can incorporate, you know, not just websites and applications on your phone, but things like video games as well. Um, so in terms of user experience courses out there, 
like I said, historically, it's, it has been tied to graphics. So if you look at a graphic communication course at Birmingham City University, um, unlike graphic design, graphic communication is focused on specific imagery or visuals, um, and it's about getting across a particular message within a whole campaign, within a whole product. Um, and But user experience is a big part of that. But so as well as learning about user experience, you're learning about different elements of graphic communication. But nowadays with how popular user experience is in this digital age, you can find very specific user experience courses like the one here at uh, up in Scotland at Edinburgh Napier University. And that is um, much like games development. This is a science bachelor's degree. Um, and this covers, like I mentioned before, uh, web design, app design, game design, um, and it's very much about creative problem solving. Um, so those are different areas of graphics and communication courses there. But generally, um, some tips when looking out for different university courses within creative media, these are two helpful things that I can help you sort of find different courses. So uh, these are the different logos for um, accredited courses. So if you're looking on a course page and you have to find uh, one of these logos, it's usually a sign that it can be quite a good course. So we have Screen Skills Select here and they cover film, TV, animation, games, visual effects. Um, and when you have Tiga, this is very much uh, focused on games. Um, but just keep in mind that just because you go into a university course page and you don't see one of these logos, it doesn't mean it's a bad course because the university or the institution has to actively um, apply to get accredited. So, if, you know, if you're looking through courses, you find one of these logos, that's great. Um, you can look deeper into it. And it basically just means that the course um, has kind of been designed to get students straight into the industry and to keep it industry relevant. But just because a university course doesn't have one of these logos, it doesn't mean it's a bad course. It might just mean that they've not applied to be credited. So before we hand over to the panel, just got some links here. So like I mentioned with Screen Skills Select, uh, we have a link here for Screen Skills website and it, give you a, it gives you loads of information um, about breaking down the different roles and opportunities within film, animation, visual effects, TV, um, and all sorts of different sort of on-screen uh, subject areas, but it also has information about training. There's even some free training that you can do if you set up a profile on screen skills. Um, and it has news bulletins about those different industries. So screen skills is really worth checking out. And uh, just like screen skills, we have access VFX. And that's very much focused on games, animation, and visual effects industries. Um, and again, it has information about the different roles available. It's very much up to date with what's happening in the industry. But Access Free Effects do a lot of events as well, and they have a really big mentorship scheme. Um, so it might be worth checking out if that's something of interest to you. And finally, we have the UCAS website, which everybody should be checking out, really, if they're thinking about applying uh, at university or some other form of higher education. And again, UCAS actually has some really helpful information um, and web pages about, about creative subjects and be specific in those different areas. So those three are just really useful to check out. So, and ah, a final thing, if you do have any questions, there's my email there on the bottom left. Um, but of course, you can pop them into the chat if you have anything and we'll be able to answer your questions later. But if you think, if you think of anything after this session, you have my email address there and we'll try to help you out. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm going to invite our wonderful panelists uh, to show their faces. Just so you know, Gavin, um, I have just put, uh, for everyone who's in the meeting, I have just put Gavin's email address in the chat. So if you do have any questions, you can email Gavin on that email address. Brilliant, thank you so much. So I'm playing around with about five different uh, monitors at the moment. It's, there is such a thing as too many monitors, I can assure you. But 
Hello, everybody. Steph, Matthew, Jack, Rebecca. Thank you all for joining today. Um, before we get started with some questions, I'm just going to go around and pick on you to sort of introduce yourself, what you do, and then we'll do sort of a deep dive into your background from there. So I'm going to start with you, Steph, if you'd like to introduce yourself to everybody. Okay, thanks, Gavin. Um, I'm Steph. I'm a visual designer at a UX agency in Norwich um, called Foolproof. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't know if you need any more information apart from that. Or that's a, a that's, a that's a lovely start. That's a lovely start. Thank you. And next to Matty. Um, so I'm Matty. I'm the creative director of a local production company called Tret Films, um, and we produce TV commercials. Thank you very much, Matty. And on to Jack. Hey, so obviously I'm Jack. I studied uh, games art and design at NUA, um, the undergraduate and then the masters. And I'm now a junior 3D artist, a game slash VFX studio in London called Fableworks. Thank you very much. And finally, Rebecca. Hi, um, I'm Becca. Um, I graduated from Norwich University of the Arts last year, um, and I'm now head of animation for a studio in Oxfordshire. Amazing. So just to, start, just to dive straight in, have some questions here, just to find out a little bit about yourselves. Um, so first one, a little bit of a hard hitting one. Why did you pursue a career in your particular subject area? And I'm going to go through the same order again. So sorry to put you on the spot there, but if you can start things off, Steph. Absolutely, absolutely. So um throughout like school um I really loved being creative it's I loved um art and design and all those things but I really didn't know what career to go into um I was also into textiles as well and there was yeah lots of options and I didn't really know what to do but I knew I wanted to be in the creative industries some way somehow um so yeah went to a lot of open days um and tried to find out what I really liked and I even applied for textile fashion courses and none of them really felt right for me um and then I went to newer um back in the day and yeah I just felt right and things started to kind of fall into place um doing like design and being creative for a reason for business sense for example um made more logical sense to me um so that's why I decided to go into the graphic communication um course at newer and that kind of I, was a stepping stone for me I really enjoyed kind of understanding the psychology and building um campaigns for brands that I know in my everyday life um and can interact with on a daily daily basis um and really kind of bringing brands to life um through visuals um so that's why I really want to get in creative industry just because I love being creative and I wanted to kind of put my skills to use um so yeah hope that answers your question yeah absolutely uh, Matty, was it sort of a similar thing for you or? Fairly similar, yeah. So um, I've always been interested in film um, as a medium, uh, something that I've always loved. And growing up, used to make terrible, terrible, terrible films for just sort of like, you know, family video cameras, that type of thing, which obviously every copy of those have now been burned. But um, it's, it's, yeah, it's just been something that I've always loved. And then... Um, I then went on to study it for three years in education, um, worked in a couple of uh, other local production companies before realizing the thing that I wanted to do was start my own and um, which was the best way to have a, your own kind of voice and your own kind of, you know, get your own kind of voice out there is to do it yourself effectively. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's basically why I just always loved film. Amazing, thank you. And Jack, what about you? Um, so I've, like, since I was like super, super young playing games with my brother and my dad, um, like playing Halo or um, Legend of Zelda, like we play like single, but we take it in turns and things. And ever since then, I'd always thought of like, how, how were they made and how can I be a part of that journey? And how can I be a part of that creation process? Um, and I was fortunate enough in East Anglia, there was a college at um, Cambridge, um, uh, uh, CRC, Cambridge Regional College, that had a game development course, um, and that allowed that introduced me to different elements of of uh, games design and games development. Um, and then obviously, it came to NUA for the games art and design course. Um, initially, came in thinking, right, I really like drawing. 
I'm going to do a concept artist. And then a year in, I was like, not a fan of this. I want to do 3D now. Um, and it was just that, yeah, like I was inspired to be in this industry because of the impact that though that medium gave on me when I was young. And I sort of want to be a part of that journey to help inspire the next generation or the generation after that to playing the projects that I then end up making. Um, Cause I think it's, I think it's amazing. But yeah. Amazing. And um, Rebecca to mount us off. I'm um, similar to everyone else. I think um, I've always loved animation. Um, since I was little, I used to watch so many animated shows. I still do. Um, I'll find any excuse to watch an animated children's show. I'll still go to the cinema. Um, but I think the main reason that I wanted to pursue it was just that it brings your drawings to life. So I've always done art. I've always made characters, but actually seeing them come to life and then seeing other people's reaction to the things that you've made is amazing. Um, I've always played games as well. So seeing all the video games growing up. So I used to enjoy like Borderlands and they've all got different styles. So Cuphead as well. Um, absolutely love the animation in that. Um, and it just makes me excited. So going to university and getting the opportunity to um, pursue that and do whatever I wanted. Um, I was sort of supported through it at Norwich. Um, and it meant that I could work in the industry, which is what I'm doing now. Amazing, thank you. Um, so, I mean, you've all touched on sort of, you know, uh, your educational backgrounds and a little bit of the journey. So just to dive in a little bit deeper with that, um, what do you think was the most useful aspects of studying at higher education, be it at university or some other route? Because I know, Matty, your, yours was a little bit of a different route compared to everybody else. Uh, but just to spice things up. I'm going to go back the other round, round the other way. So Rebecca, would you like to start off off uh, start us off with um, what was the useful, what was the most useful aspect for you when it came to studying in higher education? Um, yeah, so it was at first the most exciting thing was just meeting all the people that were also interested in what I was interested in, um, and just meeting like similar minded people and understanding that everyone who did a creative subject at the university would, could also sort of be beneficial to you. So people from the fashion course would be great for like designing clothes for animation and just that sort of cross collaboration between everyone. Um, I was really torn between games art and animation initially. Um, but in the end, I sort of figured it doesn't really matter because if I'd have chosen to do um, games art after university, that would have been possible as well. Um, and I think university allowed me to do that because I met so many people and the lecturers were just so helpful in whatever I wanted to do. So if I was interested in 2D, which I was to begin with, um, they helped me pursue that. But then I also found interest in 3D stuff. So it was just swapping between them. Um, but it was amazing to experience all of it. I sort of was a generalist to begin with. Um, and then I became sort of more focused on after effects and motion graphics, which is what I do more now. Um, but I can still do 2D stuff. I can still do 3D stuff. So it was just like getting that mixture of things and being able to collaborate and learn from other people. Amazing. Yeah. And Jack, obviously you're an anyway graduate as well. Um, but what was the, you know, what was the most useful aspect of it for you? Was it slightly different? Um, it's quite similar to Rebecca, like the collaborative process was amazing. Um, being around like minded people obviously is going to be a big step up from uh, previous experiences. But I think the independence was big as well. Like I'm I'm making I'm choosing my own journey. Um, I'm choosing where I want to go, how I want to do this. Um, and for me, especially at, uh, on games art and design, um, the, the tutor contact time was amazing. Like all of the tutors on the course collectively span across 60 years of games. So we have one uh, one tutor there, um, Dr. David Doak, who actually worked on the original GoldenEye for N64. And then we have another tutor, Chris Green, who was working for Sony on their VR projects. So both, both opposite ends of the spectrum. So even if you wanna go into something a bit more retro, if you wanna do something concept art, they have relevant tutors who come from the industry to share their knowledge and information. And I think that's, that gold dust to try and find elsewhere and because of the contact time with the tutors I was able to ask them so many questions and being being steered in the right direction um, but again on the independence having the choice of being shown all aspects of games development um, be it 
using just Unreal Engine to make like game jam games, using Photoshop, using Illustrator um, to create concepts for the games, and then using uh, Maya, Substance, Painter and stuff to then make the 3D models, and then being able to choose which one I prefer and which one I relate more to and which one I want to choose as like a potential career path. I think that was amazing um, because had I done that elsewhere, like it, it just wouldn't have been as, as viable and having the people around me to help and not only tutors as, as, as Rebecca said, like being around like-minded people, they can help you as well and they're going to be on the same uh, similar or the same journey as you. Um, so just being able to bump shoulders with those and I think I graduated five years ago, but the people I graduated with, I'm still like, I would still consider some of my closest friends. Um, so it's it, the independence and the, the tutor contact time and the people you're around is, was, was amazing. Amazing. And Matty, I know you, you're not in any way graduate here. Yeah. So what was, um, so, I mean, were you at higher education or were you at, um, was it college? So I did two years at uh, sick form and then another additional year, which I think you class as higher education, which um, was at uh, City College, the media learning company. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know how, how how it kind of stacks up to how uni works, but I suppose in a, in a similar way, um, there's a, I just found it with that kind of higher education, that kind of side of things is way more open to creatives. Um, I think the early years of education um, where you're just kind of stuck learning science and English and stuff, um, it, it sometimes makes it as if creative roles are so impossible to reach. Um, and it's not until you get into higher education um, where you kind of pick up all these contacts, I think, and um, really opens the doors. And I mean, Gavin, you touched on it at the beginning, the amount of roles that come into film. I think if you in earlier education, if you tell people you want to get into film, people think you want to become Steven Spielberg. And it's just like, that's not always possible. But um, yeah, coming into higher education, you kind of learn much more different roles and just routes uh, to get to those. And um, yeah, I think building the confidence that you know is um, attainable, I think was one of the biggest things that I took from, from education that side. Amazing, thank you. And Steph, what, yes, was the, what was it like for you? Yeah, I loved university so much. Um, I think uh, what I loved the most is having the freedom to just absolutely experiment, play around with different um, skill sets, um, different, um, so even like printing and um, yeah, illustration and photography and all these skills you can kind of incorporate into your work. Um, and yeah, you can talk to lots of different people and be inspired by their work as well as your own um, to really kind of get a really good um, understanding of what is possible and to make your work the best work it can be. And uh, so university was a great place to just experiment and have fun um, and like uh, guide yourself into like what you find um, interesting um, and then you, it, it kind of just narrows down like all those pathways to kind of find what you you want, want to do for a living um, yeah so I, I loved university and I think it I wouldn't be where I am today without it um, I think it gave me a real focus um, to what I want to do. Amazing thank you and going from obviously going through sort of education and working and you're all you know, all four of you are in these in incredible positions. Um, and so what's the most rewarding aspects of your current line of work, wherever you're, you're at? Um, I'm going to start just trying to shake things up and just pick on people random. Jack, do you want to start us off? Because Flavorworks, they've obviously, um, they developed Erica, right? They're yeah, muted at the moment always happens <laughs> um yeah uh, so erica is an interactive film effectively um they use live action uh, actors directors produce everything that a film or television show would predominantly use um but they film so many different elements and implement it in a way that the audience watches it either if you're on steam or um the apple store um or on playstation 4 or 5 you you interact and you choose the story but in such a interactive and engaging way. 
Um, but yeah, so that was amazing. I, I've came onto the um, various projects at the moment. Um, a rewarding aspect is just some of the companies and IP we're working with. Some of them, all of them, I can't say who, 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 who they are or what the IPs are. Um, but that for me is very rewarding because a lot of them I grew up with watching or experiencing when I was a child. And now I'm getting to work on projects related to those IPs. Um, but something I'm actually looking forward to, which will be a very rewarding aspect, um, something again that has been a driving force for me entering the creative industry is looking forward to seeing how others react to things that I have been a part of. Um, I imagine once the projects I'm working on get released, whenever they do get released, if they do get released, um, and just seeing how people respond positively to something that I've contributed to, I think will be an amazing aspect. And I imagine everyone else here has similar um, experiences or is looking forward to similar experiences of just having, seeing how that what they've worked on is being perceived by others and seeing if that inspires them to do the same thing or similar. Amazing. Um, Further back to you, Steph, what's, because I imagine it could be, well, I suppose what Jack is touching on about the world kind of seeing what you've been working on, but, you know, applies to everybody else. But is it similar for you, Steph, or is there something else that just is so just amazing for you? Um, absolutely like seeing people interact with the apps you build or the interfaces you yeah you design um and going to um use experience effortlessly and having a really good experience with a brand or with an app um is really good um so like if you've ordered a pizza on Domino's, you've gone through that journey effortlessly um and seeing people interact with those kind of things makes you feel good <laughs> um and also seeing their clients um we do a lot of user testing so um when we put our designs in front of focus groups we get to kind of validate um like why our designs work compared to um previous versions and that really um is really rewarding because it proves that i've got the skills that i've got are working um and yeah it makes you feel really good um and yeah they get to businesses can achieve their goals and what they set out to do so that's the most rewarding thing seeing your designs in action amazing and what's it what's it for you becca um yeah so uh, just a bit of context as to what i do actually do each day um it's mostly commercial work for businesses um but we do also get some more interesting projects like music videos um, and we've done a couple for YouTubers that have been released and got hundreds of thousands of views. Um, and just despite, it's just seeing those numbers and seeing, realizing how many people have seen that, it's something that like I've worked on or I've helped with, um, and also getting to do something different each day. So because of the line of work that I do, um, I often come in and there'll be a new project. Um, it will be, it'll swap out sort of, we'll get some projects that are about a month long, some that are a couple of days, normally they're about a week um, so each day I get to learn something new about the business that I'm animating for which to me is really interesting um, I've been learning a lot I've recently done one on mine action um, so I've just been doing subtitles in seven different languages um, and they've got voiceover recordings for each of those and to me that's a little bit surreal that people have gone through so much effort to create something to be put onto an animation that I've made and then that it will be spread about and people will be learning from it um, as an explainer video. Um, I also just enjoy the fact that now I've recently, um, we've hired someone who will be working with me um, and I'll be sort of directing, as I was already directing for myself, but now it's a bit different that I'll have someone else as well who I'll be directing. Um, and that's really exciting for me and I'll be coming in and working with them. Amazing. And obviously congratulations for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so Matty, to round things off, what's the sort of the most rewarding aspect of because it's um just you and uh your your brother that run the production yes. company? Yeah, so it, currently it's just us two and then we bring in freelancers as, as we need them to help on set. Um but yeah, I think the, the most rewarding thing, uh basically going to what everyone else has kind of said is it's getting uh your work seen and um so all of our commercials, they, they air on Sky. So we get the kind of um, the stats back of uh, kind of how it's how it's worked on there. So it's seeing something that you've created actually benefit a company. 
Um, and so the, the commercials that we produce, we, we don't do the kind of standard buy one, get one free um, in your face kind of salesy ads. Um, we take a slightly more um, kind of like cinematic route. So they're, they're almost produced as if they're short films. Um, and sometimes you can find clients that sometimes a bit hesitant about that because it's, I mean, it's not a, really a risk because um, it's just a slightly different route to take. Um, so having a client trust you and trust your vision and then get the results um, afterwards is uh, definitely the most rewarding thing. Amazing, thank you. Um, and is there anything that you all wish you knew before studying slash working within the creative subjects way back when you were, you know, in school or college? So I imagine it, it's very different nowadays with what we knew about the creative subjects and creative careers now, well, from back when we were studying compared to students now. So yeah, is there anything you wish you knew before you sort of studying and working? And I'll start with Jack on this one. Yeah, so I think one thing I wish I knew is, uh, it's, it's less so now, but especially when I started, it was quite big as the stigma behind using the term failure um, and using failure as like, a, uh, like a, having a safety net. So I wish I knew um, about uh, like failing fast so I can learn more because there's a lot of knowledge to gain from if you try something and it doesn't work, you know that doesn't work to then know what can work afterwards. Um, and instead of using failure as like you, you, you get something wrong and it's immediately negative, I think there's putting the positive spin on that and looking at the knowledge you gain from those failures to then push for something that will work and you know it will work afterwards. Um, I think that was something I wish I knew back when I was 17 because it was big when I was coming in like from school, especially with school, like you're graded eight, you know, what well, at least when I was, it was now numbers, I think now, I think it's A, a, B, C, you know, and if you get something wrong, that you, you, you haven't, you've, you failed it, you failed that paper. There is no consideration for, well, okay, I know this is wrong. How can I move forward with this? Um, I think removing that stigma would be something for me that I'd wish I knew when I was younger, for sure. And Rebecca, is there anything that you wish you knew, be it about sort of, you know, uh, that, those kind of elements specifically or anything kind of wide about the industry or just the kind of general knowledge? Yeah, um, I wish I knew like how much there is that you can learn um, and that there's no cap on it. Um, and I like would have started like, to have got a head start um, and started like teaching myself a lot more, um, a lot quicker. It's amazing as well now working nine to five, um, how much I learn in those hours and how far I've come since just graduating last year. Um, and I already feel a lot stronger with what I'm working on. Um, and I'd always been interested in illustration as well. I, I illustrated a children's book when I was 16. And now it's really embarrassing when I absolutely hate the art that I made for it. But looking back, as Jack said, it wasn't really a failure because I learned a lot from doing it. I had experience talking to a client and doing freelance work and I charged really low rates. Um, obviously now I've learned from university and working full time and doing freelance work that um, I've sort of picked up on how much I should be charging as well and how much I can learn and how much work I can fit in and obviously don't overdo it um, I obviously I take a lot on that I want to do for fun um, to enjoy it as well but yeah amazing and uh, Steph um, um, so what I'd probably tell my past self um take risks like you've got time now to kind of enjoy yourself and really push the boundaries um you don't have a client banging on your door going well we haven't done this you haven't done that um taking risks now is definitely um something to be enjoyed um and really love what you do um if you don't have it try something new it's absolutely fine um but you just have to try these things um and yeah taking those risks in the first instance normally does does reward you in the end um and yeah just yeah just having a play around with what you can do um it's a really exciting time um, and I, I'd love to go back and do it all again if I'm going to be perfectly honest um, and always ask questions if you don't know something just ask or they might not know the answer but know someone who who does know the answer so yeah, always ask questions and never be worried about asking questions there's no such thing as a yeah a silly one um yeah so yeah ask questions and take risks that's what I tell my past self 
Okay, thank you, Steph. And Matty? Yeah, a similar thing, really. It's um, the biggest bit of advice, really, is not to lose faith in yourself because you'll you'll always make bad work. Um, and it's uh, getting over that and kind of improving yourself on the next one. And obviously, when you're younger, and I, I mean, I do a, a look back at films I made back then, which at the time you can think are amazing, but as you learn more and you improve, um, you really see that when you reflect back. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think, uh, Jack, you mentioned it, that um, you kind of need to learn from your mistakes. And so that, that's a good thing to, um, a good thing to do, because if you just kept making ma amazing stuff, you'd never, you'd never learn. Um, so yeah, it's, it's getting those downs, but learning from them. Amazing. And I'm going to put a pin in my questions because we've had a few questions come in uh from our participants here so starting off with what if you haven't always been creative or aren't good at drawing or design does anybody have any kind of tips and advice for that one um just if anybody wanted to follow yes steph <laughs> um so actually my sister um also uh, works in the same business as me um and she has never really been that creative um but felt really strongly about psychology uh, the psychology of design work um and there's a lot of like um careers out there that don't necessarily need you to draw or um, be creative visually um there's a lot of strategy and thinking that goes around um cre some creative career paths so yeah don't rule it out um there might be something out there that a bit more academic um and yeah it, yeah just ask questions um and um yeah there'll, there'll probably be a career out there for you um there's more there's more to the creative industry than just drawing and painting and making pretty pictures that's that's not what it is um there's definitely more underneath the surface amazing thank you and i'm seeing more and more questions popping up now this is great um so i'm going to open this one up for everybody again with this second question so what would you suggest for someone who may not be studying something specific to the creative subjects they want to study? If, if anyone would like to answer that one. So what would you what would you suggest for someone who may not be studying something specific to the creative subjects they want to study? So I imagine if they're oh yes, Rebecca. Yeah, uh, I was just gonna say, so when I actually applied for NUA. Um, there was a lot of people applying who didn't have any animation work um, and they really wanted to do animation and just showing that they were really interested and really wanted to pursue this um, was sort of uh, already a stepping stone towards getting there. They also did take time out of like their personal time to just sort of work on their portfolio. So a portfolio doesn't have to be sort of finished work and amazing stuff if you just do a couple it depends what you want to do what sort of creative industry you want to go into but um speaking from animation um stuff like life drawing so just taking a sketchbook and drawing people on the street and um, things like that can really be beneficial yeah similar for film as well like obviously everyone has a phone with a camera so if you if you want to get into film just go and make a film it doesn't have to be about anything specific it doesn't have to be amazing but you can make a film about anything and yeah uh, and they'll say, um yeah because i went into graphic design um but i never did graphics at a level um i did art and fine art so it does kind of all feed in um so yeah it works out <laughs> yeah yeah i can attest that you know a lot of a lot of different institutions or higher degree courses love to see work outside of your academic studies um and if anything just shows how passionate you are uh, about getting into that subject area um i remember because my background's a film as well i remember making terrible films on weekends with my college buddies um and just trying to up that portfolio um so it, it would actually be quite nice to hear just a little bit from Jack, Rebecca and Steph about this next question. So what did you do to help yourself get onto your university course? Um, I guess, as Rebecca uh, partially touched on and Matty, the idea of like a portfolio, 
um, obviously for some creative places will, will require a portfolio as such. But um, what I did before is I, research, I I knew what I wanted to try and do, like I knew it was something to do with games. So I looked at different like different universities, different courses and read how the course is structured, if it's, if it's worded like that on their websites, see what is taught, what, what's important to that university and what routes they go down. Um, from there, I knew I wanted to do NU, go to NUA because of how broad it was. And I thought, right, they, they teach 3D, there's, there's concept art stuff. So can I show an interest in those aspects in my work when I apply, so in my portfolio? Um, so for 3D, I use Blender. Blender is like, it's a free to use program. There's no paywall behind it. There isn't like some catch that you have to pay for you know, you pay monthly, it's completely free and it's industry standard and it's going to be industry standard even more so in the coming years. But it's a completely free software that has a, such a big library of um, support, tutorials um, and uh, help for starting in that. So I was like, even if the models I make are terrible, they have no texture, it's nothing that they're, they're all, they look bad, but showing that I was able to teach myself to some degree and show an interest in that aspect of the course that I took the time out of my took time out of my life to to look into to think right that is included in that course can I show an interest in that um, likewise with drawing I was like right if I can do some traditional drawing as Rebecca briefly mentioned I think on like life drawing things like that there are sessions you can attend in different either online um, there are draw it like again like more tutorials and stuff on YouTube for things like that so show an interest in sketching um, and then same with um, digital drawing obviously Photoshop is a paid program but there are lots and lots of alternatives free alternatives that again just show that you are keen to learn and keen um, to, for this specific subject area and like I want to join this course because I'm keen to learn more this is me showing you that I want to learn more. I'm, I'm so keen that I'm able to do this in my own time and take time of my, my time to do this. Um, so that would be what I would suggest, I guess, it, it is showing your how keen you are. It, the portfolio doesn't have to be amazing work because that's what's going to come at the end of university. They're not after these game ready assets or perfect concept arts before you start, because if that's the case, you don't need to go to university. They're looking for in development stuff that show that you can get better and they're looking for potential in your work. They're not looking for finished products because again, like you, you would need to go to university that they would then, they would actually prefer to have someone else's work who they can then help to get better instead. Brilliant. Thank you, Jack. Um, so yeah, it'd be good to hear a little bit from uh, Rebecca and then I'm gonna go over to Steph. Yeah, I mean, Jack put it really well. Um, I had a really similar experience where I used Blender. Um, I also used a free program program called Critter, um, it's spelled with a K-R-I-T-A, um, and I used that a lot when I was growing up, and before that I used MS Paint, um, and I just did little like pixel art illustrations, and actually they're not awful, <laughs> looking back at them, like, you know, there's, there's a lot you can do with the basic programs, um, and following on from that, I also, in at sixth form, I did an EPQ in animation, so I just chose to do animation, um, if you don't do an EPQ or anything like that, then you can just do it in your own time um, and you can work on your own short film. And especially if you have time over, I know it's not summer, but if you have time over summer as well, it's just any period of time that you have where you're sitting there not knowing what to do, um, definitely recommend just doing something creative, um, anything that you're interested in at all that's creative, if you're looking to pursue something. Thank you, Insta. Yeah, so I would uh, recommend um, researching universities and finding the courses like Jack said, but also going to open days and any summer school sessions that they've got going on. Um, I think it gives you a really good idea about what your university is like and what it can offer you. Um, and I think from there on, you can kind of make a good judgment if it feels right for you and um, yeah, kind of guide you where you want to go. Um, uh, just doing like lots of research about the courses as well. Like Jack said, the skill set and what you can learn and what you can pick up from the courses. So what software they're using. Um, so graphic design, it's more like uh, the creative suite, but um, I'm sure there's lots of um, tutorials and worksheets and 
other like examples of good work so for graphic design there's like uh, boards like dnad and um, that showcase a lot of good work and good examples of of the industry and so kind of getting um yeah a good eye on the industry as a whole and what it can offer you and finding inspiration that what looks what is good graphic design for example um is a really good way to go and a good place to start so great thank you um got a bit more of a specific question here so for courses involving visual effects or games development is it necessary to have some prior experience before applying to a course like that at university i mean do you think you can speak on experience with that so i imagine this is very much jack and rebecca's uh, <laughs> area here uh i think we've briefly touched on it before like i, mm. I would say like necessarily not necessarily like not necessarily it, it would be necessary um, that's a confusing thing to say but i wouldn't say it's entirely necessary for that but it would only benefit you if you did it, even if it's not exactly like if, if the course teaches unreal engine if you taught yourself a bit of unity i imagine that wouldn't affect anything and the same with the course uses my like the games development at least teaches maya and animation have maya for their animation and things but showing you teaching yourself blender the free alternative wouldn't hinder that at all like you're you're it's only going to help you but as i said like i having a portfolio for a creative course is necessary it's just what you decide to put in that um and so yeah i guess going back to it like to have some experience like the having the experience developing a game probably not but you can pick apart what parts of development you want to be a part of and show those as uh, instead so you don't need to show an ability for every aspect because there's going to be one aspect that has inspired you to want to apply for that course if you focus on that entirely like as i said like my portfolio when i applied was about 80 percent um like digital illustrations or like life drawing sketches but i ended up being a 3d artist so that that, that has obviously changed and evolved during my time at university but they liked that i was keen to learn a bit more so i included a bit of blender um and i think the i think i ended up applying with like a really really blocky like weapon design and a very terrible uh, replication of claptrap from blood borderlands in blender and that was just straight like stipping tooled from blender there was no like fancy rendering or fancy screenshots it was just a screenshot from the blender uh screen itself with all the toolbar and everything so it's like very very low quality but it just showed the like the, the tutors who were interviewing me that i was keen to learn that aspect or keen for that uh, and that i understood and took the time to understand a bit more of the course um so i guess rounding it off yeah like i wouldn't say it's entirely necessary to understand the whole development and have experience of that um but it will only help if you you, you choose an aspect an aspect of that that you enjoy because ultimately that's what you're going to be doing. And if you show that you enjoy it and can talk about how much you enjoy that, it's, it's going to do wonders for, for the application process and getting onto the university you want to go to. Uh, is there anything you want to add on to that, Becca? Um, I mean, I suppose in terms of sort of more visual effects side of things, because you do a little bit of it. Yeah, well, I have um, more so since leaving uni. Uh, yeah. I think the university, the course has changed to animation of the effects now, hasn't it? Yes. Yeah, if we're talking any way specifically, it yeah. has changed to, yeah. Yeah, no, so, but um, I've recently picked, there's a program at Houdini, um, and they've got different versions of it where you can sort of teach yourself. I think there's the apprentice version, which is free. Um, there's definitely a student version or something that you can use, even if you're not a student. Um, and learning sort of stuff in Houdini is brilliant. There's so many like online tutorials um, just for VFX. Not necessarily, it's not what you necessarily use. Um, I'm not sure what they do use with VFX, but that's the program that I sort of taught myself a little bit in afterwards. Yeah, it's, yeah, just to kind of sort of wrap up what Jack and Becker were saying, and really, no, it's not necessary to have, you know, loads of experience when applying for those courses. Obviously, you know, some kind of, you know, to show some kind of passion and, you know, if that's what you want to go into, you need to show that, but you don't, you know, have to have this amazing portfolio um, for visual effects uh, and gaze development. And touching on Houdini, I remember when I was uh, taking part in the Access VFX workshops around 
Norfolk and I overheard we had an industry guest working on feature film visual effects at like one of the big visual effects studios in London and I heard, overheard and saying to one of our students that they are begging for people to learn Houdini because they don't really teach that because uh, <laughs> Rebecca's nodding going, yes yes so if you you could be a bit clever try and learn Houdini early and that's a really good route to go into visual effects maybe <laughs> Um, moving on with some of the other questions. Um, if I wanted to go into character design, specifically for TV slash movies, what path should I do to get that job? I wonder if Matty or Be Becca might had any sort of advice or insight into that at all. Uh, yeah, I'm not too sure really, in terms of getting into character design specifically. I mean, so go on, Becca. I was just going to say, I assume this is for animation? Uh, or is it for... I mean, uh, the question, it seems they're asking about character design specifically for TV slash movies, which I suppose, yeah, because... I mean, if it's live action TV slash movies, uh, I don't I don't know who you sent this question in, but you, you don't really have a character designer when it comes to live action stuff. But when it comes to, you know, animated shows, animated films, 100 percent character design is a huge aspect of that. And probably Becker's <laughs> has a little bit of inside knowledge of that. That's really, I mean, it's not what I've specialised in, but um, even, even in commercial um, stuff that I'm doing, which obviously isn't what you're interested in, but I do character design all the time. I'm rigging characters, um, animating them, coming up with outfits and stuff like that. I think if you want to go into character design for TV and film, um, definitely just work on your portfolio and it will like, when, when jobs start to come up or emailing companies, um, it'll be a lot easier because you'll have a good portfolio. I think as long as you have good work that will be put to use somehow, I think you'll be fine getting into the industry. You just need to have a solid portfolio, a specialist one as well. If that's definitely what you want to do, um, definitely specialise in that and create a lot of examples of work and have a look at um, existing animation as well and existing um, films, TV shows. Um, and look up the behind the scenes art books they're fantastic for stuff like that I'm trying to think about what else yeah, has anyone else got any ideas as a brief thing <laughs> as a brief thing uh, the, the the good thing with a lot of digital creative courses and the industries is there's so many crossover points um, so if it were to be for live action, like I imagine for things like Guardians of the Galaxy, designing Groot and designing Rocket would have some sort of concept art behind deciding the, the final uh, design of those characters. Um, and in that sense, trying to find crossover points being like, well, there isn't a specific, well, maybe there is, but maybe within this area, there isn't a specific film and television character design course, but thinking, right, how can I bring that back and maybe doing concept art for games would be something or for another course or concept art in general and then using the experience you learn from that to then move on to something else i know that someone on the games art and design course now works at ilm industrial light and magic working on marvel and star wars doing concept art so it, they started off in games and they're now in a vfx heavy um, part of the industry and so finding crossover points um, between courses can help with the final goal if something's very very specific um, look at something that is the, the next closest relative to that and then consider how can I then specialize after that point um, because it, again as Gavin said like there could be very specific parts of VFX TV and film that they need they are desperate to have people maybe they're desperate to have character designers for, for TV and because there's no course for that a lot of people are like well, well maybe the role doesn't exist um, so thinking about things, how things can cross over can definitely benefit you and then being considerate of that very specific role and thinking, if that isn't there, how can I try and fill that gap? Um, but yeah, looking at the crossover points and thinking, is, is this, can this be, uh, can the experience from this um, be taken to something else? And a lot of the time with the creative like digital courses, it can be, whether it be the, the, the software we use, whether it be uh, the actual pipeline of work that's, that's implemented, 
um, so many aspects are very, very similar and they're only going to become more similar um, as time goes on. And it's a similar thing, um, not so much character design, but uh, in a lot of our projects, we use storyboards. And obviously that's such a big thing um, for you know the, the huge uh, productions, like all the, all the Marvel stuff, they're, they're always storyboarded before they go into it. So that's another one of those routes where it's not specifically film making, but you need to also know the logistics of films and the kind of methods behind films to implement to that. But um, we've also the skills of drawing and kind of laying stuff out like that. Um, and even though I'm, I'm not in the animation film sector, I'm um, just looking in the when you look at courses, look at like the topic areas and hopefully there'll be some character design in there and then you can kind of build out from there. Um, and you never know, like if you need, even if you want to go like character design and you're in a course that's more general, you might actually find something else that really inspires you. So, yeah, don't don't rule out a whole subject area if it's not focused specifically on what you want to do it might be an element that you can kind of build on so yeah just thought I'd put that in <laughs> thank you everyone um we have a question for Matty um so kind of a two-parter here did you do any sort of apprenticeship for going into your production company and do you think you would have particularly benefited from a university course first? Going with the, whoever sent that heavy hitting question. <laughs> yeah. How long have we got? Um, <laughs> so um, I didn't do an apprenticeship it, uh, for a company, but I did work for a, a similar production company. Um, so they were a local production company. So from that, definitely picked up skills and kind of how production companies work so I didn't jump into it blindly um, just thinking oh, I'll, I'll do my own so I definitely had knowledge from that um, and a lot of the production companies I mean us included we we take people on um, not as, as in like full-time jobs but we always take people on to help out on shoots um, so if it's something that you're interested in doing like reach out to as many of the companies as you can you can easily find um, most of the people on like LinkedIn or just uh, for, by finding their emails um, and just approach them and just say, you know, can I come along for a shoot? Um, we, we, we tend to like to pay, but some people, um, you know, they pay in, in the experience, but um, it's good to either way. It's, it's definitely worthwhile. Um, one piece of advice on that, though, it's always great to receive emails from people like asking for work, but it's the, the ones that always stand out to me are the people who you can tell they haven't just copy and pasted an email to every production company. So um, some of the best ones uh, that I've received, they've actually mentioned like a specific video and kind of said what they like about it. And um, they've also said why they would be useful for us. So stuff like that can be great. Um, and this, the second part of the question um, about university. Um, so my business partner, uh, Josh, he did study uh, film at NUA. Um, and he definitely picked up a lot more of the kind of the methods of filmmaking from that, for sure. I think in terms of starting a production company, um, from kind of from scratch like that, it, obviously it doesn't, you don't have to have been uh, like gone to university because um, you know, the qualification, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess the experience is definitely more valuable than the qualification, because if you're starting up your own production company, you're not not going to hire yourself because you haven't got the qualification, because <laughs> that would be insane. But um, yeah, so if, if, um, if you are uh, looking to start one, uh, definitely do a uni course, for the experience but yeah apart from that you don't need to have the qualification to do it i think if i can just briefly add on to that i think i when i had i've had several interviews and obviously landed this job recently but in none of those interviews did they ever say so what grade did you get at uni it was always looking at the work i'd done during uni i, I wouldn't have been turned down if i if i didn't get a first at university like they wouldn't be well, okay so your work looks amazing um but we'll only hire if you got a first that, that, that just doesn't, at least for the games and more creative side, it's all about your work. So the, the, look for a course that will have good experience for what you want to do, because it's not about the grade at the end. It's not on the academic side of like, if you want to go into teaching or um, more maths and science, where 
the grades are dependent potentially on your job it's all about your work and so yeah like it's never going to even if it's never going to be dependent on your grade whether the, the job you get at the end it's going to be how you have adapted the like the work and your experience throughout uni to get your portfolio at the end um so you're never going to be turned down if you don't get a particularly good grade at, at uni especially if it's for an arts course thank you um we have another question which i i um I'm going to answer, I'm going to steal the spotlight and start answering this one, but obviously, you know, do chip in. Um, how does appearance realistically affect your ability to get a job like dyed hair and piercings? And just to say, because you can't see them, I've got loads of piercings on my ears. I've got tattoos all over my arms and even outside of creative work um, and within, you know, I imagine a lot of us have been there working in hospitality and things like that. It's never once hindered me at all. I don't know if anybody else on the panel can sort of attest to that about sort of appearance when it comes to jobs and interviews, things like that. It, it seems like the creative industry would be the most open to anything like that, I, I feel. Um, so yeah, I don't think that that's, it's a problem at all. Like if that kind of thing just seems very, very kind of, you know, yeah, open in the creative industry, I think. Absolutely. Um... I worked at Weatherspoons before getting the job here for three years and tattoos all over my leg and a couple of my arm, like none of those hindered me. And if anything, at the studio I'm at now, I'm currently on the number one list for best tattoo at the studio. So it's actually encouraged <laughs> to some degree. Yeah, I, just, I work for two people with loads of tattoos all over their arms. Um, it's just, I think you'll find a lot of people who like, enjoy tattoos and piercings in this industry like Matty said um from yeah my perspective like a lot of my colleagues are yeah got um lots of brightly colored hair and yeah piercings and i think that's what makes a creative industry so exciting that it's a variety of people not everyone's the same and we kind of express ourselves um how we how we like um and hopefully i like um kind of more experiences like clients and stuff can be slightly difficult because some have preconceptions i'm going to be brutally honest um but i think if you are just good at what you do and um your appearance isn't everything and they're not the clients you really want to be working for um so yeah open yeah open and um uh, creative industry is the best place for it amazing thank you all um and just to say for everybody with us, um, we've still got about 10 minutes, so keep the questions coming in. Um, we'd love to see it. Um, but sort of, I suppose, gearing towards the end of tonight's session. I mean, I, I, well, some of you have already kind of discussed this earlier, but what piece of advice would you give to your 17-year-old self uh, in regards to pursuing a creative career? Um, Rebecca, did you want to start us off? Um, yeah, I think I briefly mentioned earlier, but just keep going and keep practicing. Um, don't think you're there um, when you're 17. Don't think you have sort of reached peak performance and you've got like an amazing portfolio because you can always improve. Um, and also join communities where you can. So university is really helpful for that because obviously you'll meet a lot of people, but you can also join Discord communities. Um, there are Facebook groups. Uh, I know a lot of you probably don't use Facebook, but there's just, there are so many things out there. Instagram and social media can be really good if you use it well. Um, there are a lot of people out there sharing their work. Um, and for me personally, I'd have loved to have started um, joining creative Discord groups early on, because I use Discord a lot to play games and there were other groups that I was in. But having joined a few afterwards and since graduating, um, it's just, just a good way to have like a nice um, sort of, I don't, want, I don't know the word for it. Um, I don't know. Um, completely gone. But it's a, a great way to have, um, yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, Matty, would you like to? Sure. Yeah, I, I think the biggest bit of advice I'd give my 17-year-old self is just to keep creating stuff and also don't compare it to the people who have kind of already made it. I was quite guilty of that. Like I'd make a film and then compare it to someone who was, you know, had 10 years plus experience on me and 
ha- had all the resources because um yeah it's, it's one of those things where yeah as i said before you're always going to improve on your stuff and then you look back and um you would you see the the kind of journey you've been on and uh yeah when you're 17 it seems like the biggest step but um as you as you get older and you get more experience you're getting closer and closer to where you kind of where you were looking at really and what you were comparing yourself to thank you and steph um yeah um yeah building confidence is kind of a good way to go like yeah don't, yeah don't be too harsh on yourself you can be your own worst critic at times and yeah just keep believe, believing in yourself that you can do things um and just keep trying um but also um networking and um get yourself out there so connecting with people uh, like using work experience um opportunities the summer schools all that lot meeting people is kind of your best in um and kind of getting um good knowledge from them as well you can lean on them for support in future um and yeah just seizing those opportunities when you can because it really gives you a really good perspective of the industry um yeah and just yeah keep talking to people <laughs> and jack your 17 year old self is in front of you what are you telling them about pursuing um, their creative career i'm going to tell them that it does work it does work out in the end i think perseverance and you get out of the experience what you put in so if you if you're dedicated enough to just put in the hours during university you take the extra time to do things outside of university um as everyone's touched on so as steph said like networking so if you network outside um uh, just building up those inside your um outside and the, the more you put in you're going to get so much out of it um and as steph also said like you are your biggest critic and touching what matty said it's like you're always i tell myself not to compare myself as much but i imagine i still would at the time even if i came back from the future to tell myself don't do that um i probably wouldn't believe it but yes yeah, so it's like comparing i'd be on art especially for like games and animation and stuff like portfolio online portfolios art station and going through from first year to third year and constantly comparing my final submissions to um, artists who have been in, in the industry for 10, 15, 20, 30 years and been like, oh, why aren't I there yet? I was like, well, I've only had one year's experience at the minute and that's not even in industry. Um, so, so just be a little bit easier on myself, but tell myself that it, it, it does work, it can work and it, it will work in the end as long as I keep putting the time into it. Um, you get there in the end if, if, you're, if you're persevere enough um, and you just push it, uh, especially if it's something you really, really want, then just keep at it and it'll, it'll all work out in the end. Yeah, and kind of following on from what Jack just said, like always look back of how far you've come, like like throughout your like creative career. I can look back and stuff like, and I was like, oh my God, how, why, why was I even allowed to do that? Um, and how did that get through? Um, but then you've learned from it, you've learned those experiences and just, yeah, looking back and seeing how far you come is actually makes you feel, yeah, really proud of, of your journey. Um, yeah, and never give up. And we've had another question come through, which which I'll be really keen to hear from all four of you, actually. Um, and I think it's a topic that's really kind of come to more public discussion in recent years. So what advice would you give to keep motivated on a project even after several years of burnout? Um, so I'd be interested to hear from different people. So Matty, if you wanted to start for us. Yeah, that is, it's a good question actually, because it's that's a constant thing. I don't think you ever, there's never an answer to that to fix it because it always happens. But I think it's just um, kind of always reevaluating the stage you're at because uh, a lot of creative um, projects you'll find it's a lot of going forward and then sometimes it feels like it's two steps back but it's just constantly uh, improving yourself and yeah just taking a look at something and obviously again with, with creativity sometimes you can have just have off days where you just don't you just can't do what you want to do um, and your brain's not working and you feel like you're a failure but you can approach something in a couple you know a couple of days after take a break and stuff and um suddenly it just seems easy and, and you're in the spirit of it um so yeah it's, it's not being too hard on yourself and um yeah re-evaluating stuff i think and did anybody else want to chip in yeah 
<laughs> um, yeah, so I was just going to say taking a break is really important. Um, I actually sometimes feel a bit more motivated after taking some time off. Um, especially if I sort of take a step back and go to like what I was saying earlier about the initial stage of just sketching people on the street um, or just sketching things around you. Um, I took a holiday recently, I say holiday, it was just to, to go home and see my family. Um, but I just, I didn't have my laptop, I didn't have my computer, I didn't have anything to do that was like what I'm used to with creative creative wise but I had a film camera and I went around and took loads of photos so just mixing it up and doing something different if you are a creative person and enjoy doing stuff like that just do something different with it yeah and I totally agree with that um I have have quite a few days where I'm just like moving stuff around the page and it's not working and yeah a creative block comes into play um and yeah you just get really frustrated but you can't let that get you down like I said before you have to um see how far you've come uh, the progress you've made in the first instance and yeah just to build it on from there and kind of like refocus refocus and take one thing at a time um you can't solve the world one one task at a time and go from there because sometimes like a massive project can feel really overwhelming it's too much to take on there's too many stakeholders involved um but you just have to take a step back reevaluate and go what needs to be done first what needs to be the priority um and look at it maybe from another perspective like yeah change, change tact get some inspiration look at some books go to the library um yeah i think it's just mixing up a little bit um, and you'll get there don't worry um, we always find a solution um, just keep pers persevering and you'll get there yeah i guess added to everyone else um well i had two years burnout um creative burnout after i graduated so i just started a master's but i guess that's quite a drastic approach um, but looking at it more from like a pre-uni perspective um, as everyone said be easy on yourself um, something that I, during university, burnout can happen a lot because you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself and you also have the pressure for the deliverables during university. So it can be a very difficult time to not be burnout. Um, and for that extent, I would suggest that if you've chosen games or VFX or something, then making sure the projects that you're doing, you enjoy and don't just have the mindset of it has to be for my portfolio now, because Ultimately, that will come at the end from the from the work you do, whether or not you've decided it's portfolio work from the beginning or the end. But if you start with the mindset of actually, I'm going to really enjoy doing this project, the end result is going to be much better than doing something for, for an ulterior motive. If, if the motive to start with is I really like the idea of doing this, the end result is going to benefit for that. And at, as a result, it will be a portfolio piece as opposed to portfolio piece being the thing in your mind because then you just you're not going to see it as something enjoyable you're going to see something it, it, it is then work um which obviously uh, eventually it be, does become work like i wouldn't say that when i'm at the studio now like it's not work because it, i still can be burnt out it's just suggesting that during uni and before finding a job taking that time to do things you enjoy and then the, the end result of those will, will will come um but on burnout again like as Rebecca um, briefly mentioned, the idea of doing something that isn't what I always do. So like when I'm at the studio, always doing 3D work, sometimes I'll come back and do some small illustration work or I'll do some texture work or something. So it's something that's different. That doesn't mean that I'm always doing the same thing again and again and again. Um, finding breaks and taking breaks from looking at my work because I can be staring at the screen for five hours and decide that I actually hate the work I've done. But if I just take a small walk yeah, 50 minute walk down the river, come back and look at it. I can then look at it from a fresh set of eyes and be like, actually, that looks quite OK. Um, so taking that small breaks in between work and making sure that what you do, at least before um, work and even if it uh, after university, doing things that you enjoy um, and don't necessarily um, hinder that with the, the idea of it has to be the best work I've ever done because that pressure is not going to not going to help at all. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And that's really nicely taken us to the end of our session. Um, so Phyllis, if you wanted to come in with any closing notes, feel free to jump in. But I just want to say a huge thank you to Steph, Matty, Jack, Rebecca. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and for giving a really good insight into all the different creative media areas there.
Yes, thank you enormously, everybody. I found that really, really interesting. Love, really just so nice to hear people who are in the industry and, and have succeeded in it, because that's what I always say to students. It is a massive industry. There are loads of jobs in it. And don't just, I don't know, listen to some of the naysayers who say, oh, dear, that's a bit risky. Don't do that. You know, um, it, it's you can hear, you know, that to, to do a job that you're excited about and if you're a creative person you you need to be doing something creative you don't want to be doing a job that that suppresses that or frustrates it so thank you so much panel and um thank you to gavin and to lynn and to Nua. um and i did pop that in the chat box but i think tuesday the 9th um Nua are coming back online um to show you all how to put together a really good online portfolio which is what a lot of places are looking at now so that's another session to look out for and there will be more um i'll, I'll you know we're, we're working together this thing and and if you have ideas if you think god what would be fantastic is to do xyz or, or whatever for goodness sake um email me and we will try and put it together what i'm looking forward to is maybe some live events now because we're probably all i mean it, it's, it's great the online because it means a lot of more people can engage and and these lovely panel haven't had to come out of their <laughs> their rooms you know we haven't had to to drag them out of, you know, on this uh, autumn evening um, but it will be nice to get some online events get you into some of these companies actually to see what what it looks like on the ground so again thank you again you're probably all desperate to get off and have your tea now so um yeah <laughs> thanks again Brilliant. thank you phyllis and thank you Emma, for your support in the background there um she's popped in our email addresses um so you can contact myself or emma if you have any questions or anything so once again thank you to our wonderful panel thank you phyllis thank you ever and thank all of you for joining tonight have a good evening and take care thank you bye thank you bye